Hey guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to another retro RPG. Or is it a retro adventure? Because at the end of another week, and the end of another poll, we've got an absolutely massive win for Blackmore for Dungeons and Dragons, which is part supplement and part adventure, so it kind of ticks both boxes. Now normally I'd be holding up the front cover of that at this moment, but this is going to be a PDF review. So we'll be going over to the computer desktop to have a look at that in a wee second. And I'll be back at the end of the video with some other poll related stuff and some other channel related stuff. But before I do that, I'd like to take a moment to talk about my Patreons, who this week I have been advised are so wonderful that they don't have to ask Jolene, don't take my man. And that song's been going through my head, or at least the Lovecraftian version of it, all week. Look it up. But if you'd like to join my Patreons and help support the channel, or you'd like to gain access to these videos a week early, or you'd like access to one of the other levels of patronage, such as becoming a real honest-to-goodness fake laird of Scotland, then the Patreon's in the description down below. Check it out, it'd be very much appreciated. But anyway, let's have a look at Blackmore. So, this is Blackmore, Supplement 2 for Dungeons and Dragons, published through TSR in 1975 by Dave Arneson. Now, when I saw the title, I kind of assumed it was going to be a campaign setting. Because I was aware that Dave Arneson had the Blackmore campaign world in existence I think even before Dungeons and Dragons existed, it was his setting that he combined with the work of Gary Gygax, and the two of them then created Dungeons and Dragons together. But it's not that at all. It's what it says on the cover, really. Additional rules for fantastic medieval war games, campaigns playable with pencil and paper, and miniature figures. So it's additional rules. Now it's got the adventure in here, um, Temple of the Frog which is the very first published adventure for any RPG. And that's kind of why I'm here, because I want to see what the very first adventure looked like. But there's some interesting stuff in it as well. So we open up, and we've got, by Dave Arneson, dedicated to you, Cantrell, special thanks to Gary Gygax, Tim Cask, Rob Kuntz, and the gang at TSR, uh, Steve Marsh, for suggestions and ideas. Now this is a 2004 uh, version of the ninth printing from 1975. Which means there's probably some spell and corrections in there, but there's no major rule changes that I know. Inquiries regarding rules should be accompanied by a stamped returned envelope and sent to TSR Rules, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. In the index, it breaks down the sections. So we've got a section on characters. Well, there's a couple of new classes in here. Um, a couple of them which look very or one of them which looks very familiar indeed to 5th edition D&D players. Then we've got levels and number of experience, points necessary to attain them. Statistics regarding classes, hit location during melee, damage for monster type, then we've got monsters, monster descriptions, new magic and treasure, temple of the frog, underwater adventures, underwater and sailing encounter matrices, uh, specialists and disease. So we've got lots of additional rules throughout this to enhance out. Now some of these look very familiar. But others like hit locations, I can't think of really popping up in any major core books. So continuing through, we've got forward. Caution, this is second supplement to the highly addictive Dungeon Dragons. Handle it at your own risk. Even a brief perusal can infect the reader with a desire to do heroic deeds, cast mighty magical spells, and seek to wrest treasure from hideous monsters. I get the feeling that Gary Gygax, who's writing this forward, wrote a lot like Stan Lee. There's a section in here, um, Dave Arneson, is there even such a creature? Yes, gentle readers, there is. And shudder when the name is spoken. It's that over-bombastic version that Stan Lee used to use. It's really cool. I like it a lot. Um, now, something that this is, is rules that uh, Dave Arneson already used in his Blackmore setting. So we're fleshing out basic Dungeons & Dragons into something more, um, using lots of rules that he's written. So we go into Men & Magic, Characters, Editions. There are two additional subclasses of characters. Monk, an order of monastics martial arts, a subclass of clerics who also combines the general th attributes of thief and fighting man, and assassins, a subclass of thief. Now you've got to be kind of be careful here because there are no titles. We go straight into clerics with a wisdom score not less than 15, who have a strength score not less than 12, dexterity score not less than 15, may elect to become monks. So we go straight into it. There's no title saying this is the monk section. And that kind of runs on into the Assassins. Anyway, there's some interesting stuff. We've got Surprise, third level, they can only surprise on a one on a D6. Um, opening Locks, same as Hapland Thief. Remove Traps, same as Dwarven Thief. Listening, 
listening ability as thieves, climbing, climbing ability of thieves, move silently and hide in shadows, uh, halfling thieves, moving silently, same ability as thieves, other abilities, they may speak with animals, at fourth level speak with plants at eight, they're able to simulate death, they can control their minds, the ESP has only a 10% chance of working, able to heal once per day, um, at 8th level, suggestion and hypnosis have no effect. 10th level, they have the equivalent of an 18 intelligence with regards to the effects of telepathy. 13th level, they gain the terrible quivering palm usable once per week. Um, basically a death strike. They've got saving thrones, missile hits may be dodged. All their attacks um, have no effect if he makes a saving throw. Um... So save throw for nothing rather than for anything like that. And they have no magical abilities, they wear no armor, they never have followers. And then we're on to thieves. See, there's no title for assassins. Under special circumstances, in large campaigns, it's possible to allow the character of the assassin. Um, they function in thieves regard to all magic. They can disguise themselves, they've got la uh, languages, poison. Um, cost permission is shown in volume three their experience, and they can become a guild master to be, or challenge the guild master to take control of it. We've got the experience tables for the monks and the assassins, talking about the way they're structured with the titles. Um, there is no level above 16th. And then we're on to the statistics. So we'll talk about their move, their armor class, their attacks, open hand damage for the monks. Um, level of assassin goes through their chances of assassinating somebody, killing them with one strike. And then we're on to the hit locations during melee. So a chance of hitting somebody in the head and all that. How to use this system. When a hit is scored upon the being you are fighting, consult the above charts and adjust any wounds due to heightened weapons. So we've got different hit locations for humanoids, avians, reptiles, insectoids, fish, snakes. Um, talks with detailed rules, mortal wounds, crippling, movement restrictions, because you can cut off an arm or a leg. Um, same for flyers, reptiles, insectoids, fish, snakes. Um, weapon height adjustment matrix. So a creature attacking from above will get bonuses, weapon lengths and effect in combat, making Dungeon Dragons combat a lot more complex. Uh, different types of monsters. Um, Merman, giant octopuses, we've got some basic information on them here. Giant crabs, giant octopi. Um, trying to see ones that rec recognize. Aquatic elves, Sahagwin. And then we've got the descriptions kept separately. So instead of having a description and then a stat block, you've got all the stats first and then the descriptions later. Just seems a bit of a curious way to handle it. The illustrations are nice. Um, Hellhounds, um, giant leeches. Umber hulks, although I thought they were in, had the insectoid eyes, whereas they seem to have a set of human eyes in the middle. Or are those supposed to be nostrils? And um, carrying on through, we've got giant wasps, fire beetles, minotaur lizards, Elmosaurus, giant sharks, dolphins, Sahagwin, the devil man of the deep, floating eyes, um, harpies. And then we're on to the Underworld and Wilderness Adventures, where the Mind Flayer there. And we've got a map, and we're into Temple of the Frog. So, as I said before, first published adventure. And we've got a lot of background here. Whereas um, Temple of the Vampire Queen, oh sorry, Palace of the Vampire Queen, had a small amount of background about how the players got into the story. And... Just a couple of paragraphs about how the Vampire Queen had ended up there, what's been going on. This has a lot of information. Deep in the primeval, the swamps of Lake Gloomy, surrounded in perpetual mist, lies the city of the Brothers of the Swamp. It goes into them. A special order called the Keepers of the Frogs evolved to tend the beasts. So basically a cult developed there, and they were worshipping these frogs, trying to develop them into, or breed them, into a more powerful version of frog. Um... In further efforts to increase the number of frogs, the brothers have sought to increase the purchase of slaves for sacrifices to raise the necessary revenue by trading their handicrafts. So the cult has changed over the centuries or even perhaps millennia it's been there. 
State of affairs has carried on for almost a generation, with the temple gradually less a holy order devoted to destruction and more of an outlaw kingdom within the swamp, preying on any passing party. Um, came one day a strange individual called only Stephen the Rock. Well, Stephen the Rock is a very interesting character because he's the one that's taken over and he now commands the Temple of the Frog. He's the bad guy, the powerful one. However, he's not really a standard character. It turns he's from another dimension and he has high technology. Um, we shall come to that. But it keeps on the information that he's going through. Um, describing the outside. And then we've got locations. So, a few of the quarters for the hundred and one brothers of the order. Um, warehouses where the goods seized by the raiders are first taken and stored for inventory by the brothers. And these are way more detailed than the items we had in Palace of the Vampire Queen. Whereas each of those rooms was shown on the map, and only what was in it basically was described on a line or so. So there's a dozen guards in this room, there's a vampire in this room, and that's it along with what treasure there was. These are far more detailed, where you could actually use these to build up a description and describe them to your players. For an adventure written first, whereas I thought um, Palace of the Vampire Queen was very much like notes I would make when I wrote my first adventure. I drew a big map, and I noted on, you know, in this area there are, you know, two harpies. In this area, there is three thugs. And that's all I did. That's what Palace of the Vampire Queen felt like, whereas this feels like a modern adventure. It's got descriptions. It's got reasons why the rooms are like they are. Um, main kitchen and food hall for the Brothers community. Harbour that serves the Brothers section of the city, quite deep and can make four large merchant vessels. These are pretty darn detailed. Got a very nice map, map obviously drawn on just plain uh, gridded paper, but I like the look of it. Um, it's the best of the maps in it. They do tend to go down a bit as we're going further. Continuing through the different locations, the corner towers, and then we have further description of the High Priest of the Temple of the Frog. Um, mentions... Uh, once each year the High Priest must... Re Port to a hovering satellite station, giving details of what has transpired below, turning over any powerful artifacts taken during the previous time period. Failure to turn over sufficient loot will certainly result in his recall, trial, and extinction, as well as will, in fact, the discovery of what has just been going on below. So he's taken over powers, but he's got bosses behind him which are expecting him to turn in stuff, which is why he's stealing so a lot of these magical items, but he's also building his own power on this fancy world where he's ended up. Um, High Priest possesses a complete set of battle armor, a mobile medical kit, a communications module. Um, the battle armor, an ordinary appearing suit of mail, endows the wearer with plus three on defense and saving throws. It enables the wearer to move at a speed of 12 foot per turn, and there is no fatigue factor. Upon donning this armor, the wearer receives an 18-100 strength and 18 dexterity. Provides complete protection against all energy type weapons, including fireballs, lightning, cold, etc. And against charming hypnosis, draining life levels, and any spells which act upon the wearer physically, polymorph and decay. But it's the bearer in instant communication with all other ring wearers, so there's a bunch of communication rings which can be used. Um, plus three sword, but it also fires up to six lightning bolts per day. Uh, shield, plus three, can cast a, a ten foot ring of invisibility. Uh, medical kit, basically can put dead characters back together. Um, can churn, can also produce vaccines for the prevention of communicable diseases. Um, we've got the communications model, simply an interstellar radio, but with entertainment and instruction modules that can be used to enliven drab days of the High Priest. And it describes it. Um, the rings, the Temple Guard's rings, it goes through all the characters who have them within the Temple of the Frog. The rings in general describes their abilities. And then we're on to the ground floor, the ground floor of the Temple of the Frog. We go through the main entrance. Different rooms within it, room one. As I said, these are far more detailed. Even within the rooms, each map leads to a different monster treasure combination. Um, secret control room for the High Priest, where all his special loot is concealed. We've got the second floor as well. You can see all the numbered areas on the maps. 
These are a little faded out. As I said, the first map's the best one. These are a little faded out. The next map isn't quite as good again. Um, but we go through the third floor, first level of the dungeons. Um, Occupant, three Medusa inhabit this room, each taking six, 16, 14, and 13 hit points respectively. So very much like Pathless Vampire Queen, where it says three monsters and it gives you the separate hit points. It's got the treasure available. These Medusa were imprisoned here, but have, in the course of the last hundred years, dug their way into this room and enlarged their area of influence and operation. Since they are, in all respects, trapped here, they wait to get out and attack the Brothers of the Frog, who they hate. So we've not only got monsters here, we've got motivation for the monsters. This is an absolute generation ahead of Palace of the Vampire Queen. This is really quite a modern seeming adventure. Uh, what else we got here? Different rooms, a not bad map, again a little sort of faded, the background grids covered in it over. More descriptions of the rooms, onto the second level of the dungeon. Um, another two Medusa, 12 second level fighters and personal guards for the Keepers of the Frog. They make 3 to 5 hit points each, armoured in chain and shield. Practice with a bow, 10% chances of hitting. And then a large map. Now this is pretty bad. All the uh, hatch off areas to show what is corridor and what is rock is really quite weird. I do like the angled corridors. It makes it really hard for people to map, which is, I think, a plus in this. Anyway, continuing through. Um, we've got the treasure, the big one. One girdle of frost giant strength, potion of gaseous form, a staff to, of withering. Uh, two potions of water breathing, one scroll of one spell, polymorph self. And then that's the end of the adventure. We've got the treasure, and we go on to some more rules. So we've got underwater adventures, you know, set up. Mythology is replete with tales of sunken cities, ships laden with loot and the like. Effects of water, using trident, setting up the train, seagrass, medium seaweed, heavy seaweed, sand, fantastic terrain types, underwater encounters. So you can have underwater adventures detailed out. Um, then we've got specialists. Uh, I had sage comes... With nothing, but a library and various other aids can be purchased for him. So followers you can get. And then we've got diseases. Various different types of diseases that players can pick up. Um, I believe these kind of became core to the rules later on. But at this point, they're just a add-on rule. A nice picture of a chimera. Or chimera. A page for notes, which I always loved in these. And then a list of other releases by TSR. The Monster Manual, the Basic Set... Collector's Edition, Record Pad, Greyhawk, Black Moon, Eldritch Wizardry, Gods, Demigods and Heroes, etc. Just so many cool things, including The Dragon Magazine, the only professional magazine of fantasy, swords and sorcery and science fiction gaming, formerly The Strategic Review. So, it's a really interesting adventure. The booklet itself has a bunch of quite cool rules. It's really interesting to see what was being added on to Dungeons and Dragons, Virtually immediately it came out. The elements which uh, Dave Arneson probably wanted to be core, but Gary Vygax had overruled him and stripped down the rules to make it a nice, easy-to-publish volume. Because they didn't know it was going to be a success. And the adventure is fantastic. I have to say, Temple of the Frog is absolutely brilliant. I obviously haven't played through it, but... The fact that it's so detailed, everybody's got motivations, we've got all this history. The one thing that is missing is a reason for the players to get involved. But the fact that they are attacking people as they go through the swamp can easily be dropped into any adventure. So the players are travelling through a swamp going from A to B and they get attacked. And they have to go and get their loot back or other events they become aware that there will be loot there and they decide to go and raid it or whatever it's a weird way of doing an adventure without having a purpose you know they've heard of the temple of the frog but it's leaving a lot up to the games master there so they can slot it into their campaign but it's a nice little thing you can drop in there's lots of uh, background for you to add hints before you run it 
you know, the players can hear, oh, don't go through the swamp. People disappear in the swamp. Those Temple of the Frog guys, they'll rob you blind. But it's absolutely fantastically detailed. I can't rave about it enough. I was so, so surprised to see something so detailed from this era. I kind of thought we were going to get another Palace of the Vampire Queen, which was a nice little thing, but this is absolutely brilliant. So that was Supplement 2 Blackmore, and that won the poll this week with an absolutely massive 54% of the vote. More than half all the votes cast were cast for that. I know I was excited by it, and I was glad to see that my audience were also really, really interested in it. But that means there's not a lot between the other ones. Coming in second place on 17% was Rift's World Book 4, Africa. In third place was Games Master Pack for Price of Freedom on 12%. The Last Crusaders for Deadlands, Hell and Earth on 11%, and then lingering way back behind was Capital, Pride and Profit for Mutant Chronicles on only 7%. But as usual, they're all cleared out of the poll, and I'm going for a new one. But because I felt that Blackmore covered both a retro adventures and a retro RPG, I've decided that this week I'll stick with the retro RPGs, because I've got more supplements in role-playing games than I have adventures. So I'll catch up slightly in that. So first up, we've got the Dark Text source book for Dark Conspiracy. Now this is by Games Designers Workshop for one of their later games where Earth has had rifts open up and alien things and dimensional monsters and dark elves and horrors and all these things are coming through and aliens are arriving. A fantastic game with loads in it, which sadly wasn't very heavily supported. And this is one of the few source books that I have for it. Next up, we've got Paranormal Animals of Europe for Shadowrun. Now, I've covered the Paranormal Animals of North America before. It'd be nice to finish this series, because there were only the two books. I thought they'd be going round the world, and maybe covering other biomes and continents, but they never did. They just did the two books. Next up, we've got another Rifts book, this time World Book 20, Canada. Now, Rifts is a fantastic game, and they filled in. They did cover the entire world. So we're going from Africa losing in the last poll to let's see how Canada does in this one. Then we've got contenders for the Street Fighter role-playing game. I've covered the Street Fighter game before. I thought it was absolutely wonderful and really weird that White Wolf, who was so famous for their World of Darkness games, used the same rule system for a Street Fighter game of beating people up. It's a lot of fun and I'd love to cover the source books for it. So let's see if that wins. And finally, we've got Denizens of Earthdawn Volume 2. Now, I've covered Volume 1 because the Earthdawn setting is one of my favourite settings, and it's very, very different from other fantasy games. The races are have their own twist on it, especially because the world is innately magical. So, rather than just a source book where they're going, these are elves and they're typical elves, it's filling in a lot more. And... We went through Sourcebook 1, it'd be lovely to cover Sourcebook 2, especially to get back to Earththorn, because as I said, I absolutely love that setting. On other channel-related news, well, things are carrying on. It's recovered a lot from the attack, which meant that um, this channel wasn't showing up as much. The one-second views, which actually hammered my viewer retention ratings. It's not completely come back, but it's a lot better. We're back up to about 80% of where we were before that attack. So, hopefully, fingers crossed, that we're going to get back there and the channel will completely bounce back. It hasn't ruined it. Um, over on Drive Through RPG, well, as I mentioned last week, I'd kind of made a mistake because you're not allowed to put up Call of Cthulhu, Cyberpunk, or Shadowrun stat blocks on drive through RPG. So I've had to withdraw all those books. I've repurposed some of the creatures and things for 5th edition fantasy because you are allowed to use 5e stat blocks, but I've not been making a lot of progress with that. Obviously, if you are interested in the Cyberpunk, Shadowrun, and Call of Cthulhu stat blocks, well, they're available to Patreons on a shared Google Drive. So if you join as a Patreon of Laird or Librarian status, you'll get access to all of those. Obviously, the Patreon's in the description down below. Check it out. 
and over on RPGGamer.org, well, we're covering the Ahsoka series, working our way through the episodes of that, statting out characters, statting out the ships and things that have turned up in it. I'm really enjoying going through it. There's been a bunch of other people commenting. My co-administrator's come back on with a bunch of ideas. He's adapting from older versions of the Star Wars role-playing game. Fantastic stuff. If you're interested in Star Wars D6, pop on over to the site and check it out. It'd be very much appreciated. But anyway, as usual, I think I've witted on for quite long enough. So thank you very much for watching. But as always, most of all, you look after yourselves. And I'll catch you later. Bye now.